Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Fish Bites, the Miami Herald's Miami Marlins podcast. I'm Jory McPherson. He's Andre Fernandez. Dre, we're at the All Star break. How are you? I am. I'm good. I'm watching the home run derby right now, and uh, wishing I was at L- in LA watching this. Probably the most fun part remaining of the entire All Star week. Now that the game itself has kind of turned into more of a show and a circus, then <laughs> but we'll get into that later. I, I I always enjoy the derby though, especially in the last few years. I mean, I was lucky enough to be there and cover the the Giancarlo Stanton power display of 61 home runs back in 2016, and and since the rules of the since the rules changed in the event where you can just hit them and hit them over that time or uh, with 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 the clock and the matchups, I think that that was I'll give baseball credit for that move. Uh, they did a great job, and now it's more exciting to watch. You know, I got to see the 2019 one in Cleveland, the first of Pete Alonso's home run derby championships. And I'm know. assuming he's going to get his third one by the time we're done with this, or if not, the end of his reign of of consecutive home run derby championships. But Let's yeah, no, yeah. I mean, again, I'm also very biased toward in favor of Pete Alonso getting to cover him for for two years at the University of Florida no. before he became a big leader. No, I know. I've only said this once or twice, or. Hell, I've lost track of how many times I mentioned it. But anyway, uh, I'll start. We'll touch on the All Star Game and the Marlins' connections to it in a little bit. Yeah, but first, Pete Alonso, right? Right now, as you're saying that, Pete Alonso yep. signing autographs before he goes to try and win a, to, to try to repeat. Yep, him going up against Ronald Acuna Jr. first round. But before we get to all of that, the Marlins. Yeah, it was supposed to be a pivotal week for them. Pivotal homestand. The four games against Pittsburgh. Homers. Correct. The Pittsburgh Pirates, four against Pittsburgh Pirates, three against Philadelphia Phillies, trying to stay in the in the wild card race. They went a healthy two and five. I mean, the unhealthy, the the downright anemic is uh is what I just said. They're the team that's not hitting homers at a pretty soon to be franchise historic rate because of eight straight games. I mean, the power outage, but the power outage is one thing. If they were at least producing runs and you know get stringing hits together, that sort of thing. They're not doing any of that. Yeah. And it's a big pro and it's a huge problem right now for them for a team that put itself in a pretty good spot a week ago when you looked at it in terms of, you know, you're you're feeling good about yourself. You split with the Mets four. You think to yourself you probably should have taken three out of four from the Mets. And not so much in the climb for the division, but to but where it puts you in the wild card. Three back, three and a half back, striking distance, and you're thinking, all right, awesome. Now, let's say they pull within two. Let, let's throw a number out two, maybe, going into the All-Star break. Okay, they're right in it. Instead, you sink to five and a half, where you're not dead completely, but now if it's more the glaring problem where you don't look like you can win, you can string together many wins at all, the way this this uh, anemic offense is going. And, and And really, it's not just one guy. You know, Don Mattingly talked about it. You know, I covered the game on Sunday and he talked about just, you know, they're 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 not creating traffic on the bases. It's not even so much timely hitting, it's just not getting guys on at all. Guys are probably pressing a little bit, trying to do too much out there right now. And you're missing one of your biggest catalysts. You're missing right. Jazz at the top of that order. I mean, he creates he sets the table and he creates so much offense by himself that even talking to Mickey Rojas at the end of the game, he didn't name Jazz by name, but he said he's like right now. We don't have anyone carrying us or anyone that, that you know, sometimes lineups need that guy to kind of be, you know, the, the, the spark. And, you know, without naming names, I mean, it kind of all signs point to that guy being, you know, the all-star himself who uh, the sooner he can get back, the better, because this team, it, the way it's going right now, I mean, we'll see. They needed a break I and mean, see if the three days somehow maybe help a little bit, but they're fading fast. If, if this keeps up. Yeah. When you look at the offensive numbers, we'll just base off of from when jazz went on the IL on June 29th, 52 runs in 18 games. That's 2.9 runs scored per game. They've been shut out three times in that 18 game span, two runs or fewer in nine of those 18 games, no matter how good your pitching is, that's yeah. not gonna, you're not gonna be able to do anything. And when you look at individual guys since July 1st, uh, I'll go from the bottom up. Jacob Stallings, who we've known his offense has been atrocious all year. He it's he's hitting 091. Gary Cooper, all-star replacement is in the designated hitter spot for the National League, 135, seven for 52 with 21 strikeouts. 
Jesus Sanchez, seven for 51 with 12 strikeouts, 137 average. Nick Fortes, who has been the better of the hitting options at the catcher spot and had some good moments at his first month, six for 31, 194 average. De La Cruz, 196. Avisao Garcia, 216. They only have three guys hitting 250 or above among the regulars. Anderson and Aguilar hitting 250. Joey Wendell hitting 265. That's – you can't expect to be winning games when those are the numbers that you're looking at. And, again, you saw the, the one game they had a chance to salvage in that Philly series when Sandy was on the mound, they lost one run game. They only scored one run. And yeah, they, had the base, they got the bases loaded in the ninth with one out and – Stranded three, stranded three guys with their last two abs that could have potentially walked it off, and and then they just got shut out the final two games. It's just it's a rough patch for them at this point. You're 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 forcing Sandy to be perfect at that point, and even though he has spoiled everybody this year the way he's pitching, but you know you should win when you only give up maybe one or two. You should still have a very good chance of winning, and they're they're not even giving their pitchers that. I mean, one run. One run in the entire series against the Phillies. This is a team that the Marlins have played well against in recent years, even even during some of their these these lean years of, uh, since since this ownership group took over. And they put nothing like nothing. There was a lot of there. There were a few chances sporadic here and there, but not really a lot. Even the ninth inning. I mean, you lament the ninth inning the other day on Sunday because they put two runners on. They were down four nothing, but that, but two runners on maybe have a chance. And then there's a bad call, so it's like okay, even that happens to them. But you have so many other chances before that and do nothing that you can't it, you can't totally pin it on on that. And you know it, it looks like you're kind of you know lamenting one thing. You know if the umpire strike zone Nola was still really good, but. It's not like anything they haven't seen before. It's just this team is just not hitting. I mean, in the in the in the narrow view, it is a bad patch. Can Jazz help when he gets back? Absolutely. But in the big view, I mean, I think one area of concern again, I think, goes back to the offseason pickups they made and that outfield just not consistently producing. They've had flashes here and there, but it continues to be a problem because by now. We thought this outfield was going to be Jesus Sanchez, J.J. Blade, you name it, another out when any of their other outfield prospects that they drafted in recent years that by now probably could have been there or at least, you know, taking their first reps at the big league level. And only one out of those three guys that, that I've mentioned are, are up. And, and even they're going and they're going through their growing pains, their learning curve, too. So, you know, where at what point? Do they finally get some of these guys that they're trying to develop up or do they go out and, and get the right fit to have a consistent formula that can get there? I mean, you know, I know contractually probably wasn't the right thing, but I mean, you know, you had two guys in Duval and Marte last year that were that were pretty good, better than what you're seeing overall in terms of the potential, like what they can produce. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that I think in the, in the long term, that's a big problem, but in the short term. If they want to make anything out of this season, it's got to start Thursday against the Rangers. And Jazz is not going to suit up, I doubt it, that, that early. You know what I mean? They're still going to have to labor through his absence for a little bit longer. Yeah, for me, the earliest I think Jazz, Jazz will be back will be Monday when they start their series with the Reds, especially yeah. since their Jazz is out in L.A. right now for all the All-Star festivities. And even if he wasn't, there's no minor league games until Friday anyway. He's going to need right. to go through at least a couple of rehab assignment games before right. he comes back. Yeah, so, so they're going to have to find a way. Yeah, so, so definitely not going to be – I would be shocked if he's back in the lineup for that Thursday game against Texas or anything of that weekend series at Pittsburgh Friday through Sunday. Best case scenario is start to rehab assignment Friday in Pittsburgh, plays through the weekend, and then joins the team Monday in Cincinnati. Misses only four the first four games back. But even then, you look at what their schedule is, they've got – They've got three, ten. They've got twelve games left until the trade deadline. So right. One game against Texas, three with Pittsburgh, four with Cincinnati, three with the Mets, and then the first game of their next series against the Reds before they have to decide one way or the one way or another. Right. Is there yeah. enough time to do it? And if there is enough time, how close to perfect is a team that has shown that it isn't perfect? Are they going to have to be to in no. order to? Keep keep this path that they think that they they can go on. Which again, as we've been saying, it's a very short amount of time to 
prove a lot that hasn't been proven this year. They they were they were looking at being they they are present tense hoping to be buyers and but what what you know five and a half now and then what happens if this slips in the next few days down to seven eight nine back at that point I mean are you really going to add on for a, for a, a pretty much hopeless cause at that point or a seemingly hopeless cause at that point as far as this season goes I mean they're in that. They're in that narrow, they're, they've reached the point in the past, by now you knew what your direction was. But this year is especially tougher because that's going to be in limbo, or seemingly in limbo, until right about maybe a few days before in terms of how what your team at least is going to look like. I mean, whether you make up your mind before that or not, that's on them. But, I mean, for the outside world, <laughs> unless a move happens between now and then, where they're going to be, I know it's if they if this slide keeps going, it's it's going to look like it's not worth it to bring on a piece for this season for what if you're that far back and seemingly hopelessly out of it. I mean, even when you look at the standings, I mean, they just blew a big chance against the Phillies. The Cardinals are going to be the Cardinals. I think they're going to stay in the fight. I doubt they're going to slump too badly down the stretch. And the Giants were really waffling for a while. Now they're back in it. So they really have blown a big window to get to get back in it now i don't know i don't know if there's enough time to to make up for it unless they come out on a tear right away in the second half and if they don't we're most likely gonna get to see some of those guys you mentioned some of those prospects like lade etc cetera, etc cetera. already got to see one of those guys on saturday max meyer finally got called up to make his big league debut through five and the third innings it was he took his lumps there were some positives in there his slider does look the part but Overall, it wasn't the pristine outing like we've seen from some of their other top prospect debuts over the last couple of years, like when we saw Sixto and Edward in 2020 and 2021. Uh, Max gave up five earned runs over five in the third innings. He was great the first time through the first couple of times through the order, then a couple home runs derailed him in the fifth and sixth inning. Then he put a couple runners on before getting taken out in the sixth. There were spots to build on, but also the reminder that Mel Stoudemire Jr. told a group of us before his start, Max Meyer still is not a finished product. This is him being up in the big leagues is basically the next test for him because regardless of what he was doing in AAA, the numbers there were great, but AAA was basically very watered down this year in terms of competition level. So in order to actually know what they're going to have in Max Meyer, they need to see him up here at the big leagues and also the Marlins rotation still being somewhat in shambles in terms of the injuries opened up the opportunity for them to at least see what they have in him. And again, there were, again, there were some rough spots. He got hit hard once the Phillies got gotten, gotten to see him and got through the second and third time. The big thing is to see if he's able to keep that level head, the, the calm composure while he's on the mound. And if he's able to make the adjustments against hitters that are of more quality than he's seen over his two years in the minors. You saw some good stuff. The, again, the seven strikeouts, I think it was only walk one, but he still needs to figure out how to figure out his pitches and also his changeup. That third pitch needs to figure out if that's going to be a good enough pitch to give him three, which he'll need if he's going to be a starter, because just having the fastball slider combo isn't going to slide in the big leagues as a starter. Yeah, and he didn't throw too. He didn't throw too many of those. Only threw like twelve of them uh, the other day in the start. Out of all, uh, doing the math, the quick math here in my head, that would be seventy nine pitches he threw in That's the game. Right, if my yeah. math was right. Yeah, so he didn't really get a chance to really establish it. Got tagged pretty good on the on that pitch as well. Didn't give up a ton of like extremely hard contact, but they did barrel him up a few times, like you said. But again, like yeah, of course he's not a finished product. It's one one major league start. You can't take. You know, I mean, several guys. It's going to take a while for any of these guys. And you're never really a finished product. <laughs> that, that that's yeah. kind of you know, that's kind of cliche anyway. But not even close when you're when you're at that at that point. The interesting thing is going to be how long does he stay up? Mm -hmm. You know, and then in depending on also cor correlation with where this team is at too. Correct. Because you want him, you want to put him out there to learn to develop and all that but you want to stay in it too so i mean do you give them maybe one two more starts maybe don't put them in maybe 
after two, three games out of the break to kind of see where the team is at. Where do you where do you line them up in the rotation now going into the second half? And then also depending on performance, if he's getting shelled or the or or there are signs that he that it that it's not quite time yet, then obviously you have to make a decision and send them back for some more fine tuning. Or does he start to show some improvement, show some adjustments, show that he can handle elements of being a big league pitcher where maybe if, even if the results aren't super sexy and a great ERA or anything, but at least he's showing that he can handle some things. He makes adjustments well. Maybe they make the decision, does he stay longer up and, and keep that going at the big league level? So the next couple of weeks are going to be interesting if you're following Max Meyer to kind of see where he's at. And to see also, you know, where where it falls, where the team is at. How does that how, what's going to benefit? Hopefully they do what's good for him, too, because you don't want him also to get shelled out there too long. Or also, you know, it, 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 it's a good experience because right now you are in you're, you're not pitching in September for a team that's 30 under and it means nothing. I think there's a little element there that is good that he is starting conceivably his next start or even his next two starts at least could be games that do mean something that you're trying to keep the team, you know, play off alive. Yeah. And there's also the factor of what happens when, when uh, Jesus Lazardo and Edward Cabrera both come back, they both did rehab assignments over the weekend, both pitched three innings. So once you have the hypothetically of both of them, you have Cabrera Lazardo, you have Sandy Alcantara, Pablo Lopez, Trevor Rogers, Max Myers. You got six and Braxton Garrett. You got seven guys for those five spots. So right. there's also the point of figuring out who you want up at the big league level, who ends up going down, who ends up potentially being a trade piece come August 2nd. I was going to say, put your, put your GM yep. cap on exactly. right there yep. and put two and two together of where they may be thinking in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I think I think that's definitely a consideration. I mean, you know, a couple of those guys could conceivably be in play, and, and some of that will probably be nudged by how the next five or six games go. Yep. Yep. And we will get to those games once everything gets back on Thursday. Now let's shift to what's going on in the present. First off, All Star game on Tuesday, and at, with the quick home run derby update, P. Alonzo knocked out Ronald Acuna Jr. in round one. 20 home runs to 19. So just had to throw that in there. Uh, I'm sure a lot of Marlins fans do not – well, not that Pete Alonso isn't a Marlin killer at the plate, but I think past history, maybe a lot of Marlins fans wouldn't mind that result. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's a it's a damn if you do, damn if you don't situation on either yeah. end of that one. For There's a, there's a little more ugly history. There's a little more ugly history with the guy who lost that matchup. So that that's why I say, that's why I yeah. say that. Yeah, I mean, he also – Got a little too close to the fire before the entire home run oh derby began in the first place. Yeah. 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 The, the pyro almost got him. Yeah. But for Tuesday, we have – Marlins have three play, three all-star representatives in Sandy Alcantara, Jazz Chisholm Jr., and Gary Cooper. Jazz was voted in as the starting second baseman, but is not playing because of the back injury. Gary Cooper will be a – he is a reserve on the National League roster – assuming he'll pinch hit at some point late in the game. And then Sandy Alcantara will pitch at some point in the game, but not the first inning. Clayton Kershaw yeah. was named the National League starter. Shane McClanahan will be the starter for the AL. But, I mean, obviously Sandy had his case. He's We know the numbers, the, know where he is, basically the, what looks like the front runner for the Cy Young Award. But it felt all but inevitable that Clayton Kershaw was going to get the NL starting spot. Just it's L.A., it's Clayton Kershaw. That basically ends yeah. the argument right there from the from that perspective. Yeah, you, you have a future Hall of Famer at home. You, you, what else is he going to ever get a chance to do that in his home ballpark at this point in his career? They're not going to come back to Dodger Stadium before he retires. So, yeah, I mean, it was kind of obvious. I think they were going to go the home cooking route at that point. But, I mean, look, even if Sandy comes in the second inning, the third inning, still, like, take it in and, and just – you know, light it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and look, and, and he, I think you have to look at it. He, I think he, he and everyone can look at it hopefully in a way where this isn't just hopefully for his sake, a fluke, what he's doing this year. I mean, he may not pitch this good every season, 
But I mean, if he's going to be the next pitching star in this league, or one of them, you hope this is something he builds on, and that he will be at least in the conversation for something like that another year, where you don't have, you know, the the, the stars aligning perfectly for for a Dodger to pitch at Dodger start to sorry to start the game at Dodger Stadium. I mean, next year um, in Seattle, I believe. You know, I believe so. Yeah. I mean, King Felix isn't there anymore. So, I mean, there's no like, I mean, unless there's some phenoms Mariners pitcher that we don't know yet that might surge and do something. I mean, who knows? Maybe who's to say, you know, Sandy has another, you know, maybe maybe be grateful to Marlins if he has another year like this. But, you know, I'm just saying there could be another opportunity down the road to get something like this. But, I mean, 10 years from now, if we look back and Sandy's a seven time all star, something, let's just say, I mean, I think we're going to look back at it and say that's pretty darn good, you know, for especially at that point, he'll be he'll he'll definitely be among the greatest players the franchise has ever had. Definitely on that note. And then to shift over to the other big news that's been going on this week, the MLB draft. Marlins had the sixth overall pick on Sunday. They went with LSU third baseman slash outfielder, mostly third baseman, Jacob Berry, who just based off of his numbers, Kick and hit. Let me actually pull everything up. Uh, freshman year when he was at the University of Arizona, 352, 17 home runs, 19 doubles, five triples, 70 RBI. And then sophomore year after he transferred from Arizona to LSU, hit 370, 630 slugging, uh, 15 home runs, nine doubles, only struck out 22 times while drawing 27 walks in the SEC. And defense – Little shaky. It's they're gonna try. They're gonna let him start out at third base. See if he's able to handle it as he goes through his pro career. If not, he'll most likely shift over the first base DH type role. But from what I've heard from Marlins senior director of amateur scouting DJ Spillick and talking with both his coach at LSU and Arizona Jay Johnson and his high school coach in Arizona, they both say that he's just a guy who instinctively has a knack for barreling the ball. He's a switch hitter. He's able to hit basically evenly from both sides, even though he's a more natural right-handed hitter. So the bat's not a problem, and it's a matter of how quickly he develops, which, as we've seen over the last few years, developing hitters in the Marlins organization has not been as successful as the Marlins have probably hoped. And that's putting it nicely. A a power-hitting corner infielder, potential first baseman type, wasn't there one of those in 2018 that I wish they would have drafted? I think he yes. went to high school down here. Yes, yes, he did. The initials are TC. Yeah, yeah. Played well, for played for the United States in the Olympics and did pretty well out there too. Yeah, yeah, him. Well, oh well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, I mean, look, if he can hit the way it sounds, I mean, the way he projects, I mean. We just spent the past, you know, half hour or whatever talking about how badly they need exactly. offense. I mean, obviously, he's not going to come in maybe for a couple of years at least, but it's another projectable bat that, especially from both sides of the plate, that's that's a big help, especially a guy like that. I think that's a rare combo of, you know, it's not the middle infielder type that you see they, that they seem to always get that you see that switch hits. This is a little different. So it's in areas, it's in a position where, if he can play third base in the long term, again, we've talked about it. They don't have maybe true third baseman that, you know, depth in the organization at that spot necessarily. So that would help too. And I think just you got to bring in as many of those as you can because, I mean, look right now, Khalil Watson's had some trouble. There's no guarantees on some of these guys. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I think it was a solid, definitely a solid pick amongst the guys that were there. And again, a college bat. So in theory, could be a little closer to what you want, where it wouldn't, wouldn't take as long. And again, you know, you check the you check that box. You check the box of competition level. He's playing at one of the best programs. He's playing in you know a conference that do, again dominated college baseball. And the ACC guy here is going to cough while he says that to the SEC guy. But credit where credit is due. I mean, look how many teams dominated in the SEC again this year, and and went to Omaha. And, and, and won the national title with Ole Miss. But, I mean, he faced all of those guys. So, all, all that pitching, I mean. So, yeah. I, it's, a good, it's a solid pick. The interesting part to me was what happened today and since because 
it was like, I mean, to go all pitcher for a while there, it was all righty, righty, righty. And like you described in your story today, if, if people haven't read it yet, it's up on Herald.com, on MiamiHerald.com. The, uh, a lot of projectable, potentially relievers, maybe. Yeah. Guys, maybe swing men. I mean, we'll go, you, you go through the list. I like a couple of the, the early, the ones early on, especially I think that the third round pick kind of caught my attention. Uh, the kid from Missouri. Uh, Carson Milbrandt, yeah, you know, six two, one ninety, one sixty six ERA, ninety one Ks can you know touches ninety six, spins the ball well, which is always the biggest thing. It's not so much velo as much as how much you can locate it, how much you can spin the ball. If you if the curveball slider change of combo as well, I mean, you could be looking at future starter type there, maybe. I mean, that that's a good pick. The rest of the guys, I mean, you saw you saw they went pitcher heavy. I mean, I, some people are going to look at that and be like. Isn't bats what they need? I mean, yeah. I mean, you do need pitching depth. You always do. But, I mean, there's an organization that we keep saying needs the needs the sticks, right? Needs the need, and, and have, like you said, they haven't developed. A, a lot of them haven't developed into what they hoped. So, let's see. I mean, you, you, we're, we're recording this, and there's still a whole day three where, you know, you never know. Maybe you find some hidden gems. But, I mean... Take yeah. it away. I mean, yeah. you, you, you saw it. I mean, yeah. I don't yeah. know. So, I, 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 yeah. I, I wonder if they should have sprinkled a few position players in there, found something. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. So the way that I understood him from what DJ Svillick said to us after after day two ended on Monday was that round after taking Jacob Berry, number six overall, they, they made a concerted effort rounds two and round three to go with pitchers, specifically the two high school pitchers who they targeted. Uh, Jacob Miller in the second round. And as you mentioned, uh, Carson Milbrand in the third round. I like both of those picks. Uh, Milbrand, yeah. as you mentioned, the, the four pitch mix as a high school, as a high schooler, that's to already have three pitches that he's comfortable with. That's a very good start. And Miller, Jacob Miller, it's essentially the same way. So to have those two guys as guys you can have that already have three pitches they feel comfortable with to be able to start bringing them in from the jump, that's good. The rest of the guys, they went college the rest of the way. Uh, a lot of these guys are basically, it feels like they're either fringe starters or looking like they're going to be relievers long-term no matter what. The first three, uh, rounds four, five, and six. Round four was right-handed pitcher Marcus Johnson out of Duke. Fifth round, right-hand pitcher Josh White out of Cal. And sixth round, uh, Jared Poland, right-hand pitcher out of Louisville. All three of them, righties, they – Bounce, they started as relievers at their respective colleges and then were starters their final year going getting into the weekend rotation. The Marlins view all three of them as starters from the jump, which is typical protocol. If somebody has a chance to be a starter, you let them be a starter until you realize until you get to the point where you say, Yeah, you're not gonna be a starter anymore. Get ready to start working out of the bullpen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the, the other, whole thing. You don't yeah. draft the bullpen. You draft guys on the potential guys will go to the bullpen later if yeah. they if when once you give up on them being starters, or if they have a limited pitch arsenal where you, you can tell that you know they're not going to have three plus three or more plus pitches, like they're going to have maybe they're they're solid at one or two and short bursts, but you kind of figure that out in turn when when you're in the development phase, not now. You know yeah. what I mean? So that, that's a, that's that that was the intriguing part is. You know, you can't. To me, you can't really peg guys this early. You got to see how they develop at this level, and and then go from there. And a lot of guys you won't know until they, if and when they get that opportunity, and hit the big league level. Can they? Can they make it? Can are they? Do they? Do they show those tools at, at the next level? I mean, and, and, and as, again, I'm going back to the big picture point. We always say, when you take a step back, look at the look at past drafts. We're here sweating all this, but. Very, very few of this list of twenty odds are are going to make it even close to the big leagues or even stay there. So, yeah, I mean, if you look yeah. at the Marlins past their draft since new ownership group took over from twenty eighteen through last year, obviously last year was twenty twenty one drafts too early to start determining anything. So twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty, those three drafts, only three Mar only three players have made their debuts from those three classes. Nick Fortes in the fourth round from 2018. Alex Vestia from the 17th round of 2018. He's now with the Dodgers. And Max Meyer making his debut last week. That's and, only it Max Ma and only Max Meyer was a high-profile guy who was a first-round right. pick and then a highly-rated prospect. Vestia wasn't that. No. 
that that's he was an unranked prospect when when I remember when he pitched at the Arizona Fall League and then he got and then he went on that run, caught everyone's attention. But and and then Fortes too. Fortes was an under the radar guy that now has earned his opportunity. So none of the top tier selections that you've made, except for Max. I mean, that's everybody else you've gotten through through trades. Yep. Basically. Yep. Yeah, and you look at Connor Scott, then when they took him, what was it, 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there in, tw- in the 2018 draft, ended up trading him in, as part of a package to get Stallings. Uh, Will Banfield still – when Will Banfield just got promoted to double A, and but he's been – this is year, what, five for him now? And yeah. again, he's, from the original, I, he's from the original class. Yeah. yeah. And you look at the Bladey draft, J.J. Bladey is the only one out of the top seven from that draft class that has yet to debut, and there's – I think it's – up to thir- 12 or 13 guys from that first round that have debuted already, including yeah. if you look, went a little farther down, Alec Manoa from South Dade with the Blue Jays. He was picked like 11th or so. I know that he's one of your guys that you keep raving about and yeah. been pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and Max Meyer was the fourth out of the first round from the 2020 draft, which, again, that, yeah. that draft still being the awkwardness with the COVID year and then not getting it to start playing till last year, but yeah. still. But there's still guys. I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's, they have some of those guys are on the cusp, and the side for it'll say, okay, but they're almost there. You probably, if you have this conversation six months from now or a year from now, they're gonna, you're gonna see, oh yeah, okay. But look at all the guys that have made it already from other clubs that could have been picked. Not even the ones that they couldn't have had, but the ones that they that had that got picked after, and have already mm-hmm. made it. That's the damning part if you look at the last five years. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how it turns. I mean, maybe, you know, it's the frustrating part if you're a Marlins fan that has stuck with them, you know, through all these years and all these changes because, you know, it's like how long how long can you sell hope without some kind of tangible result? And they have been better this year. Let's not – 43 and 48 is nothing. Oh, my God. But it ha- it is some progress. If it stays sort of on that, I mean, they it, technically it is better than last year, but I think you want it to see them – you want to see them take that – even if they don't make the playoffs, but feel like you had a chance, a realistic chance, because that, that's something they hadn't had uh, other than the, the blip year. They, they haven't really done that. So not not regress into a 70 win team and, you know, 43 and 48 right now. I mean, it, it, if they don't come out playing a lot better, you know, <laughs> it could get a little scary. Yes, it can. And we'll touch more on that next week. This is going to wrap us up for this week's episode of Fish Bites. I'm Jordan Pearson. He's Andre Fernandez. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll be back again next week.